What a great song. I, you know, it is true that so many people, Christians, have the wrong idea about Christianity. They think somehow that God has promised that if we're Christians, nothing bad will happen to us. Have you read your Bible? <laughs> Do you know how many of the first Christian leaders died because of their faith? Yes. Were killed, yes. martyred. Why would you think God would spare you a little pain and hardship? It doesn't work that way, and it never was supposed to. Honestly, I think that is one of the devil's favorite tricks to play. He, he gets people to think, uh-oh, something bad's happened, I must be doing something wrong. Well, sometimes you are. Sometimes God lets bad things happen to get you back on the right track. But sometimes it's just part of life. God has a way of turning bad things into good. He'll turn your sorrow into joy, as the song said. We need to learn to take advantage of those things that God puts into our lives, even the painful things. Do you agree? All right, I want to make sure I had the right people here I was talking to today. Because if you had said you don't agree... I might have to change my sermon a little bit. No, just kidding. I'm, I'm preaching the truth, whether you agree with it or not. The title of my sermon today is, How to Take Advantage of God. Uh-oh. Pastor's preaching heresy. You'll see what this is about in just a minute. But first, I want to remind you what God has us as a church focusing on for 2022, this whole year. See, too many Christians today see themselves as individuals living for God. I know lots of people. That's the way they think of their Christian life. It's me and God. Me and God. That's not how God made Christians. It's not what He made us to do. God doesn't want us to live as isolated Christians. In fact, I will give you this. You can't. You cannot live an isolated life and be a Christian. You can't do it. There's too much of what God has called us to do that involves other people. And if you're not doing that, you're not obeying God. It's not what God wants for us or from us. Remember, it's not about you. It's not about you. Church is not about you. Being a Christian is not about you. Everything we do is all about God. God has called us to unify with other Christians in a local church so that we can give encouragement and hope and help each other have hope. Help each other grow. See, God wants to use you to build His house. You know how I know? This is the scripture God gave us for this whole year. 1 Peter 2.5 says, And now... You have become living building stones for God's use in building His house. You're living building stones for God to use to build His house. How can He use you if you're an isolated Christian? If it's just you and God. He can't use you to build his house if there's no other people involved. 
but he wants to use you. In fact, Peter went on to say, what's more, you are his holy priests. You get to go right into God's very presence, like the priests in the Old Testament used to do, and nobody else could. So come to him, Peter says, you who are acceptable to him because of Jesus Christ, and offer to God those things that please him. That's really what this is all about. Offering to God the things that please him. This is why you need to be in church every time the doors are open. Because you are God's building materials. The building materials God uses to build his house. And he can't use you if you're not here. We are of no use to anybody if we're off doing our own thing instead of helping to build up the church. We need to learn this. We need to learn to live for God and for others instead of for ourselves. Stop focusing on me. It's not about you. And the way we're going to build this house this year is by sharing our faith with everyone. Leading people into that relationship with God that he wants them to have, that you have with him. And then bringing them to church to learn how to live as a Christian, live that Christian life. The things that we learn here every week and how to share their faith with others. You see how it grows that way. I'm telling you, if we will commit to doing this, to building God's house this year, by this time next year, this will be a completely different place. Standing room only. I was just thinking that the size of our building, the people that are here, if we could multiply by 10, we would have to have more than one service. To accommodate everybody. We wouldn't have room for everybody. There wouldn't be even be standing room if we did that. And all it would take is each one of us bringing ten people to God and bringing them to church. That's not too hard, is it? Especially since this is what God has called us to do as Christians. This is not supposed to be above and beyond what we're supposed to be doing, this is not supposed to be something spectacular. Bringing people to God, oh, could I do that? Well, yes, of course. That's what you're called to do. Last week we discussed five things that we need to train new Christians. Once we have brought them into that relationship with God, we need to train them in five things they need to bring in that, into their lives right away that will keep the devil from stealing that seed that was planted. You remember those five means of growth we talked about a little bit last week. First, the Bible. Second is prayer. Third, worship. Fourth, fellowship. And fifth, witnessing. Those are the five things. The five ways that we grow. We need these things into the lives of ba new baby Christians as soon as possible. Last week we talked about the Bible and how important that is. Today we're going to talk about the importance of prayer for new Christians. Prayer is, you know, it's one of those things that oftentimes we make it into something that it's not. I've had people come to me many times and say, Oh, have you, have you ever heard brother so-and-so pray? Oh, wow, does he pray well. I've never quite understood that. Is it flowery speech that makes a good prayer? Saying the right words? What is it that makes a good prayer? Something for us to think about 
as we go into this message today. And here's something I've discovered that I think is just incredibly cool. Whenever God asks us to do anything, He always provides a way for us to do it. And not only that, after He provides a way for it, He then helps us to do whatever it is that He's asked us to do. He helps us accomplish it. It's not like your boss at work who says, I need this done by 5 o'clock, and he doesn't lift a finger to help. And in my job, oftentimes, my, my job outside of the church, I, 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 am, I am sure, I'm positive, that I have a whole bunch of managers that sit around in a room and they go, what is the most difficult project that we can think of, the most impossible task Let's give that to Michael. God doesn't do it that way. When God asks us to do something, He provides a way for it to happen, and then He helps us to get it done. That doesn't mean it's not hard work. We still have our part to do. But think about it. God tells us we need to go to church. And then he provides a church that gives us exactly what we need, and he meets us there. How incredible is that? God tells us we need to read our Bibles. And then he helps us understand what we're reading, speaking to our spirits as we read. Prayer is no different. God tells us we need to pray. Prayer is important for Christians. But after God tells us that, He then helps us. He helps us pray by providing His Holy Spirit to actually pray for us. Did you know that? I might teach you something new today. Look at this. This is from the Bible. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says this. Also, the Spirit helps us. We are very weak. But the Spirit helps us with our weakness. We don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit Himself speaks to God for us. He begs God for us, speaking to Him with feelings too deep for words. God already knows our deepest thoughts, and He understands what the Spirit is saying because the Spirit speaks for His people in the way that agrees with what God wants. This is what I want to focus on today. When you become a Christian, you begin learning how to give your life to God one piece at a time. To become a Christian, it is imperative that you ask God to forgive you for all of your sins. Everything you've ever done. You are to repent that is, turn away. Stop going the wrong direction. Go the way God wants you to go now. Does that mean from that moment on you're perfect and you never do anything wrong again? If you are, come and talk to me. I've got to figure out how you did that. Because I don't know anybody that is. You ask God to forgive all of your sins, and guess what? He does. He wipes them away. The Bible says things like, God forgets your sins. Forgets them. As if you never committed a sin. God makes you pure, holy. It's like all your sins are written on a whiteboard and God takes a big old eraser and he just goes, okay, they're gone. Hallelujah. 
And then you know what I do? I write that sin back up there. Every time I sin. Yes, God forgave me, but I am far from being able to stop sinning. Fortunately, God is patient. (laughs) And His mercy is such that He will forgive me every time I ask Him. He will wipe it away and forget I ever did it. You can ask God to forgive you of a sin and five minutes later say, God, you remember that sin I just asked you to forgive me for? And He'll say, nope. You sinned? I don't remember that. The process of learning how to stop those sins, getting rid of them, changing our habits, changing the way we live, the things we do, the way we think, is what will take us through the rest of our lives. It's spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, and it's a little bit at a time. And the process is different for every person. Some people give up their bad habits first. Smoking, drinking, cussing, gone. Some people, it takes them a little while longer to give those things over to God. But they grow in different areas more quickly. Some people give up control of their their minds immediately. Lust, bad attitudes, anger, gone. And some people take a long time to grow in those areas. As long as we don't stop giving those things over to God, we're growing. Where it gets bad is when we say, eh, it's good enough. And then that sin just starts building and building and building. And it takes over. It's like a cancer. When it comes to prayer, this is one of those areas where we we grow. We learn from God. How he wants us to pray. We need to learn how to put prayer into practice in our everyday lives and do it right. We need to be in the habit of praying. And remember, God always gives us what we need to fulfill what he wants us to do. So, if you're ready to learn to pray effectively, God has promised to give you His Holy Spirit to help you pray. So what I want to talk to you about today is how does the Holy Spirit help us? Here's your first fill in the blank. If you're following along on your handout from your bulletin or on our church app. How does the Holy Spirit help? Number one, through weakness. Wait a minute. Did I write that right? Through weakness? The Holy Spirit helps us through weakness? Remember, the passage we just read says this. We are very weak, but the Spirit helps us with our weakness. That's an interesting way to put that. I want you to think about that for just a minute. It seems like God could have put this a different way. Like, we are weak. God, the Spirit, helps us to be strong. But it doesn't say that. The Spirit helps us overcome our weakness. It doesn't say that. It says the Spirit helps us with our weakness. What does that mean? Well, God knows our every weakness. He understands that we're often just not strong enough or not wise enough to do the things that He asks us to do without His help. 
And the truth is, it's better to just let him. <laughs> it really is. Because the weaker we are, the stronger he is. Paul learned this when he asked God to make him strong. You remember God's response? Look at this. This comes from 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Each time he said, My grace is all you need. God, I'm weak. Help me to be strong. No. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Doesn't this just go against our logic? We are all about becoming stronger, more powerful. We have seminars, classrooms. We have counselors that will teach people how to be stronger. God says, my power works best in weakness. So Paul writes this, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's face it. Our big, biggest obstacle to prayer is ourselves. We get in the way. We try to do things in a different way than God wants them done. We say, God, make me stronger so that I don't need you. And he says, why would I do that? I want you weaker so that you cry out to me for help. I want more control in your life. I don't want you having more control. You see how that works? We often get in the way of hearing God's answer when we pray because we're too busy worrying about the outcome before He even has a chance to answer us. But this really is a result of our own sinful nature being in control instead of God being in control. We're trying to be strong. I admire people who can kick a habit. Habits are hard to kick. Any of you ever tried to kick smoking? That is one of the hardest things to get rid of. It just, it takes control. And I've known so many Christians who say, I'm just praying that God will give me the power. Maybe that's the wrong way to pray. Maybe what we need to say is, God, I know I can't do this. I need you. Come on in and take over. Don't let me do it anymore. I obviously can't. We need to let God be in control, don't we? We need to go ahead and be weak. God, I know I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't. You know I can't. That's all God's waiting for. He's waiting for your permission to take control. We attempt to find the answers ourselves. William Barclay, one of my favorite Bible commentators, wrote this. He said, there are two very obvious reasons why we cannot pray as we ought. First, we cannot pray aright because we cannot foresee the future. And we may well pray, therefore, to be saved from things which are for our good. And we may well pray for things which would be to our ultimate harm. You know what he's talking about there? So often, 
We pray for God to take pain away from us, take sickness away from our loved ones, when it may be that that's exactly what God wanted to happen. Or we pray for God to send something into our lives. Money, God, I need more money so I can do more for you. And it may be just the thing that completely destroys our lives. That's what William Barclay is saying. We don't know the future. And so we don't know how to pray correctly. Second, he writes, we cannot pray aright because in any given uh, situation, we do not know what is best for us. God is often in the position of a parent who has to refuse his child's request or compel him to do something he does not want to do because he knows what is, in, what, what is to the child's good far better than the child himself. Allow yourself to be weak. That's what God is looking for. Don't stress about anything except allowing God to answer your prayers in your weakness. Give up your worries, your pride, your fears. Give up all your weaknesses. God, they're yours. I'm weak. You take my weaknesses and do something with them. Allow the Holy Spirit to replace them your weaknesses with His strength. Don't try to do it yourself. Can I get an amen on that? Oh. Monday and Tuesday this week, I want you to make this a focus of your prayers. Ask God to help you through your weaknesses, not make you stronger. Let's look at number two. How does the Holy Spirit help? Through intercession. He intercedes. Did you ever feel like you just don't know what to say when you go to pray? You ever get tongue-tied when you're talking to God? You're just not sure how to say things correctly? I think oftentimes we sound a lot like this. Take a look. For English, say yes. Yes. For security purposes, this phone call will be recorded. To continue, please say yes. Yes. Please state your password. I ain't no hollaback girl. Please repeat. I ain't no hollaback girl. Please repeat. No. No. I don't know. Yes. No. I think you said magically delicious. Was I correct? No. Where to? I'm going to shoe in resident. I think you said I'm going to shoot the president. Please hold while your call is traced and the proper authorities are notified. Sometimes you just want to get straight through. That's why there's prayer. Prayer. Live richly. I think you said I want to shoot the president. Sometimes I think we sound like that when we pray. You know, Paul understood this problem because he wrote, as we read a minute ago in Romans 8, 26, we don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit Himself speaks to God for us. He begs God for us, speaking to Him with feelings too deep for words. Isn't God good? Sometimes we don't know what we should be praying for, let alone how to pray. But in those times, the Holy Spirit in us talks to God on our behalf. This is called intercessory prayer. It's kind of like when you pray for someone else. You step in to pray for them. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. Only the Holy Spirit talks to God in a heavenly language that human words can't adequately express. You know, there's a whole lot of controversy surrounding the, the spiritual language. But 
Some people believe that this heavenly language which goes on between God and the Holy Spirit living inside of us is the same language that Paul described as the private language of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14.2. Take a look with me. See, what, see if you think you see this here. He says, if you praise him in the private language of tongues, God understands you, but no one else does. For you are sharing intimacies just between you and him. Interesting. There is a private language that is only between you and God. Pastor Michael didn't say that. The Bible said that. You can see it right there. The Bible calls it tongues, which is really confusing. <laughs> because that's what all languages are called in the Bible, tongues. And so it gets mixed up a lot with other tongues that the Bible talks about. But this private language happens when your spirit connects with God's spirit and you speak in a heavenly language that only God can understand. That's what this scripture says. The Bible talks a lot about people speaking in tongues, actually. And, and when this phenomenon first happened at the celebration of Pentecost, right after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, it was explained that this spiritual gift was connected to what the Bible calls being filled with God's Holy Spirit. Look at this in Acts 2.4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Understand, being filled with the Holy Spirit is a different thing from having the Holy Spirit in you. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit in them. But not every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's much like having a full bottle of water is different from having a bottle with some water in it. Make sense? If the bottle's not full, you can't claim, I have a full bottle of water. And unless you are full of God's Holy Spirit, you can't claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The truth is, God usually gives this, this precious private language to believers as a sign. That when they surrender themselves completely to God and allow His Holy Spirit to fill Fill them all the way up. Now I'm not saying this is the only way God works. I'm never going to put God in a box. And say this is it. That's, that's how he does it. But I will tell you this. In my experience. This is the way it usually works. When someone says. I am ready to give myself 100% to God. Not just, God, forgive me, I repent of my sins, but the next step of growth after you've done that is, God, use me in every way you want to use me. I want to be your instrument in this world. Fill me up with you. Get rid of me completely. In my experience, this is usually when God will give people this precious private language. And it's a sign that he has fulfilled that request. And that they have been completely filled with the Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean that they will never falter again. 
But it means at that moment, they have completely emptied themselves of self and filled themselves up with God's Holy Spirit. I also believe this private language is available to anyone who surrenders themselves to God. And again, this is where some of the confusion comes in. This is different. This is a different gift than what the some, at least, of the disciples experienced on the day of Pentecost because they were actually speaking in known languages. But remember, the scripture that we read said, no one understands the private language except God. It's a different, it gets confused because it's called tongues both ways. Don't be confused. But this is one of the ways that the Holy Spirit prays for us. And whether you have been filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of this private prayer language or you are still working toward giving up all of yourself to God and, and being able to be filled with His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can intercede to God on your behalf. And that's what God wants. He wants you to go ahead, as we learned in point one, and be weak. Realize your weaknesses and say, God, I'm weak. Be strong where I'm weak. My weaknesses are yours. Take them over. And then intercede for me. Holy Spirit, talk to God for me. Say what, what I want to say in a way that God will understand. Tell the Holy Spirit what you need. And let Him pray for you. In fact, Make that a focus of your prayers this week, Wednesday and Thursday. When you're in your alone time with God that you have every day, ask God to help you to allow the Holy Spirit to pray for you. Before we move any further, let me just throw this in. If anyone wants to know more about being filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I'm going to be available here at the end of service at the altar. You just come on up at the end of service and we'll talk about it. And I'll explain it to you the best that I know how. Okay? This does not need to be a big show. I know there are some churches that make this into a huge show. Look at me, I can speak in tongues. You know what Paul said to the Corinthian church when they were doing that? Big deal. I can do it too. In fact, Paul said, I would, that everybody would speak in tongues. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. But I'd rather you give five words that people can understand than 10,000 words in a tongue that nobody understands because it doesn't help anybody. See, tongues, that private language, it's to help me. Not anybody else, me. And so if it's not for anybody else, why am I screaming it out in front of a whole bunch of people? And in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul explains very clearly, that's the wrong way to do it in church. In fact, he said, two or at the most Three should speak out in tongues in any service and only if there's someone to interpret what they're saying. If there's nobody to interpret, the person speaking in tongues needs to shut up and sit down. Well, that's Michael's version. But that's what Paul said. He said you need to stop. Because it isn't helping anybody except for you. And it helps you. That's great. Do it in your own prayer closet. That's great. It's helpful for me. But remember, church isn't about me. I'm here to help others. I'm here to worship God. And worshiping God in my private language where other people don't understand it doesn't help anybody but me. 
And Paul said, if people who don't understand come in when you're doing that, they're going to think you're crazy. He really said that. Look it up, 1 Corinthians 14. He said, tongues are a sign for unbelievers. They're a sign that you've lost your mind. I'm not kidding. Look it up, 1 Corinthians 14. It's there. Let's move on, though. I don't want to get stuck there. Let's look at number three. How does the Holy Spirit help? The Holy Spirit helps through obedience. Through obedience. If you can't obey God, you're not much of a Christian. See, when you allow the Holy Spirit to intercede for you, not only does He give you strength in your weakness, not only does He make you strong because you're weak, not only does He tell God what you want to say in words that God, God understands, but He helps you keep your life aligned with God's will. Look again at Romans 8, 27. We read it a minute ago. God already knows our deepest thoughts, and He understands what the Spirit is saying because the Spirit speaks for His people in the way that agrees with what God wants. We often don't know how to pray. As William Barclay said, we don't know the future. We often pray for things that would hurt us. Or that are against God's will. The Holy Spirit won't do that. He will only pray those things that agree with what God wants. I often find myself praying selfish prayers. Because I don't first consider whether or not what I want is God's will. I just know what I want. My mom's sick. God heal her. Did I stop to ask if this is part of what God is doing in her life? Oftentimes I don't. But when the Holy Spirit prays for you, He speaks in a way that agrees with what God wants. When the Holy Spirit is active in your life, He intercedes on your behalf but he does it in a way that agrees with what God wants, in, with God's will. He won't allow you to get out of God's will for your life. He keeps you obedient to God, even when you don't understand what God is doing. i got to tell you this. I'll be just very blunt. God almost never does things the way I think he should. Almost never. Are you like me? God is constantly doing things and I'm going, God, what are you doing? If I were God, I wouldn't do it that way. And yet he is always 100% right on target. See, the Holy Spirit will keep us right there with God. Obedient. I know that there are times you aren't sure what God is asking you to do. Not even sure what the next step to take is. In fact, this is one of the questions I get asked the most as a pastor. What is God's will for me? How do I know God's will? Well, allow the Holy Spirit to intercede to God for you. And He'll help keep you on the right path. In fact... This is so extremely important for every Christian to stay on the path that God has us on. It is so important. Listen to what Jesus himself said. Matthew 7, 21. He said, not everyone who calls me their Lord will get into the kingdom of heaven. Only the ones who obey my Father in heaven will get in. That means even if you think you have a better way than what the Bible says, you better do what the Bible says. I know so many Christians. In fact, maybe some of you right now, when I was talking about 
What Paul says about tongues, you're saying, well, I wasn't taught that when I was growing up, and I think the pastor's wrong. Well, that's okay. But you better do what the Bible says. There are a lot of things we're taught in church that don't agree with the Bible. I've found lots and lots of things in my life where I came across the Scripture and I went, God, forgive me, I've been doing this wrong my whole life. And I didn't even realize it was wrong. The Holy Spirit will help you stay on the path of obedience. Let Him control your prayers. It takes obedience to enter God's kingdom. That's what Jesus said. That's why it's so important for us to do what Jesus asked of us. What is the most important thing Jesus asked of His followers? The number one thing. We call it the Great Commission. Let me remind you what it says. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All power in heaven and on earth is given to me. So, go and make followers of all the people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey Everything that I have taught you, and I will be with you always, even until the end of this age. You'll notice what it doesn't say. It does not say, go and live your life in the best way you can, and that'll be good enough for me. And God will welcome you into heaven because you did the best you could. We have a commission. Every Christian. We call this the Great Commission because it is the most important command we have been given. We are to make sure Everyone we know is living a life obedient to God. Teach them to obey everything that I have taught you. Not take them to church so the pastor can show them. We, every one of us, are commissioned to go into our world and make disciples. The Holy Spirit keeps us on this track, helping us to pray prayers that adhere to this commission that keep us in line with what God has called us to do. Keep us obedient to God. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to God on your behalf and to keep you doing the right things. Keep you fulfilling this great commission. Let's make that a focus of our prayers too this week, Friday and Saturday. Ask God to help you be obedient in your prayers. So worship team comes forward and we end this service. Let me just end by saying this. Prayer is such an important part of every Christian spiritual life. It's not something that you just can do when you feel like it. Or you only talk to God whenever you need something. It's supposed to be a constant. The Bible tells us, pray continually. Pray without ceasing. It's supposed to be part of our every moment. Too many Christians think of prayer as a way to get the things they want or or to get God's blessings, but it's so much more. You cannot grow spiritually without prayer. And Christians who don't have a daily habit of prayer are weak and vulnerable. You having a hard time living your life for God? Maybe it's because you don't have a good prayer life. 
We spent a whole year last year learning how to pray in the way that Jesus taught us. His prayer model we call the Lord's Prayer. There's so much to prayer. I can't get to it all in one message. But I will tell you there would be fewer problems in your life. There would be more leaders in a much larger church here if people would just learn to pray. Just pray. God is willing to help you pray by giving you His own Holy Spirit. Take advantage of His offer. Take advantage of God, the Holy Spirit. Let's pray in closing that God would help us learn to pray the way that pleases Him. If you can, let's stand. If you're interested in learning more about the private language of tongues, while I'm praying, just come on down to the front. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful message on prayer that came from your word. God, I know that this is controversial, and I know that in, in preaching it the way that I have, that I'm sure I may have stepped on toes, and there may be people who are offended or maybe disagree. God, I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You know that. But I also want to preach the truth in a way that people will grow closer to you, be more of what you want them to be. And God, I want to give people every advantage to live a life that is pleasing to you and do great things for your kingdom. God, I'm praying today for every person who is listening to this message, whether it's here or it's at, at uh, the recording on our podcast. God, that you would just help every one of them to get in touch with your Holy Spirit that you have placed inside of every Christian. God, that first of all, that we would just allow weaknesses in our lives and allow you to just take control of those. Realize where we're weak. Not try to be strong, but let you be strong for us. Let you intercede on our behalf through your Holy Spirit that you have placed inside of a, every Christian speaking to you the things that we really want to say and how we want to pray. And God, that it would help us stay obedient to you. To continue doing the things that you have called us to do. And God, help us to use this private prayer language to speak to you in our prayer closets. To talk to you in a way that edifies us. To pour out our hearts to you in a language only you understand and make us stronger because we're allowing you control. Thank you, God, for all of the help that you give us. Make this church what you want it to be. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.